You're restless. You're twitchy. Something plagues your mind, nibbling at its edges like termites at a doorframe, weakening you structurally, emotionally. So you get out of bed and you walk, you don't know how long, until you come upon a little shop. You're not sure where. And the shopkeep says she might just have exactly what you need. We're playing the sounds below from Earbud Theater, right here on Radio Drama Revival. Hey folks, welcome to Radio Drama Revival, the podcast that showcases the diversity and vitality of modern audio fiction. I'm your host, David Reinstrom. We have a submissions box, listeners, at RadioDramaRevival.com, and I tell you, I do my level best to go through those submissions, but show producer Matt pointed out to me recently that it was possible to clear the productions we'd already played from the queue, which enabled us to do some excavation. And as is the case so often when we do this sort of thing, we came upon a gem. And I've been kicking myself for not running this sooner. This piece is from 2014, and that's when it was submitted to us, and yet we never ran it. So, big shout-out to Matt for making the way clear, and a shout-out to Monique for serving as our submissions editor and wrangling all of this stuff in the first place. Shout-out to everyone that has ever submitted a show to Radio Drama Revival. We would not exist without you. So, here is what we found. Earbud Theater is a project headed up by Casey Wolf out of Los Angeles. It's an anthology horror series, and those of you who have been with me since I started hosting this show a couple years ago will know that I'm a slow adopter to horror. But I think I'm starting to get it, because the way I feel when I listen to Earbud Theater is a kind of gentle, creeping shiver that suffuses my person. I still don't like being startled. I don't think that's fun. But I'm starting to like that subtle consuming horror that comes up on you slowly. I dig so many things about the way this show is written. I I love the way it distributes its roles. I love its performances, its subtext, its design. It's just solid. Now, consider yourself warned. This episode is going to be spooky and deal with death and its attendant traumas. If you're not in the mood for that right now, maybe pass this one by. There aren't any jump scares, and the death isn't a surprise. Without further ado, here's The Sounds Below. From Earbud Theater. an accident. The car sank fast. I remember the water coming in. I remember Paul's voice. Chris! Chris! And then, nothing. Next thing I remember, I'm on the riverbank, freezing and soaked and alone. The doctors tell me I've blocked out the memory of what happened down there. No shit, is what I tell my doctors. My wounds healed. We buried him. I went back to work. After a while, life found a kind of rhythm. But maybe a year later, I started having these attacks. Panic. I had never really known what that word meant, the way some switch could just flip in your mind and suddenly there was no fighting the fear that comes over you. I was afraid in elevators, afraid in my shower, afraid of rain, of loud noises. I hated it. Hated the weakness. Brooke, my girlfriend, told me I should see a therapist. I held out as long as I could. You believe your brother saved your life? Yeah, absolutely. What convinces you of that? It's the kind of thing he would always do. I'd get in a fight, Paul would come in, break it up. He protected me. Were you happy to be protected? (laughs) What kind of question is that? Uh, I mean, as we get older, our feelings change. People want to feel like they can take care of themselves. Dr. Cates, this isn't about childhood. I didn't have these freakouts when we were kids. The accident started it. This is what you've told me. You think I'm lying, do you? I didn't say that. (sighs) I see what's going on, you know. Oh? Yeah. 
It's like you bring someone over to fix a leaky sink, and he's like, oh, no, we've got to repipe this whole thing. Oh, and hey, while we're doing that, have you met my buddy who does tile? <laughs> you want everyone you treat to be some never-ending puzzle so you can just run the clock. Hey, what are you writing? Uh, never-ending puzzle. It's an interesting phrase, that's all. It's a simple problem. My brother's dead. I'm freaking out, so let's go after that. As you wish. Tell me what happened. I told you. No, you told me what happened before and what happened after. Tell me what happened. I don't remember what happened. And you think your problem is simple. Dr. Cates and I would go around and around like that for an hour a week. It took a lot of money out of my pocket. And all the while, the attacks would keep coming. I couldn't even drive myself anymore. I had to take the bus. The bus is no place to get away from fear. And the nights. Sometimes when the lights would go out, I, I'd hear it. The rushing water. My brother's voice. No! <gasps> Are you okay? Chris, talk to me. No, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Were you having a nightmare? <laughs> it's not a nightmare. It's all right. I'm here. You're safe. I can handle it. I can handle it. Where are you going? I just need some air. Go back to bed. The darkness makes the quiet things in the city louder. Dripping water, lonely cars on late errands, buzzing lights. If you took a guy who lived before electricity, dropped him into the city at the quietest part of the night, I think he might go deaf or crazy. I walked for hours, took some turns I'd never made before. Suddenly, I saw this little shop. It looked like a fortune teller's place or a pawn shop, I couldn't tell. All the writing on the window was in some other language, except for a dollar sign and one English sentence. What are you afraid of? Through the window I could see trinkets and jewels. There were lights on, dim ones, and when I tried the door it was open, so I went in. Hello? You open? If not, you ought to lock this door so you don't get robbed. We do not get robbed. Whoa, hey! <laughs> Didn't see you there. Nor do we steal. We make trades here. Only fair deals. It was with the dollar sign. Hermes was the god of bankers and tricksters. He carried the caduceus, a staff wrapped with snakes. Now it is the symbol of your money. But it is much older than that. So, uh, what are you, a banker or a trickster? What is the difference? Wow, lobbed that one in for you. What do you offer? Offer? Yes. You are here to make a deal. I'm here because I was wandering around outside and I don't know what street I'm on anymore. Wandering outside. Interesting. It's dangerous out there, you know. There are bugs, and beasts that lurk, and in the shadows even stranger things. It makes me shiver just to think about it. How brave you are to wander the outdoors so cavalierly. First time I've been called brave in a while. I know. Because you have fears. How do you know that? They are my business. Okay, wait. Is this some kind of healer voodoo or something? What do you mean? Like, I'll walk on coals or you'll throw some chicken guts around and say I'm cured? No voodoo. Just trade. I will trade you for your fears. Oh, ho, ho. now I know why you're open at night. It's the only time you can hook people on this stuff. <laughs> you almost had me. Sorry, old woman. No sale. Doctor. What? I am Dr. LeBeau, and I am selling nothing. Just offering deals. Yeah, yeah. Heard that the first time. And I am always here. Always open.
I couldn't sleep until you got back. I'm fine. I just wanted to walk. It's almost sunrise. I walked a lot. You've been telling me to lose weight. Is that a joke? Look, I love you. I'm sorry I scared you. You don't have to go through this alone. Let me help. Can you snap your fingers and take these freakouts away? I'm not a witch doctor. What? I said I'm not a doctor. Let me just get some sleep. It'll be better tomorrow. It's okay if you're not better tomorrow. What does that mean? I just mean it's normal. One day at a time. <sighs> yeah. It didn't get any better. I barely slept anymore. I cashed in some vacation time at work, but sitting at home was worse. I have to admit, my thoughts kept going back to the doctor, not my therapist. The one with the strange little shop. But I couldn't even remember how I'd found the place. So, I went wandering again. Sometimes it felt like eyes were watching me from the windows, from the alleys. I didn't even think of them as people, just eyes. And then, I found the place. Dr. LeBeau's. Hello? Welcome back. I guess you never forget a face. I never forget a fear. Every person is like a vintage of wine, carrying the whole story of their making in a delicious bouquet of fears. Now I remember why I left. Look, how does this work exactly? You make a deal. You offer me a fear, and I give you something in return. Isn't it enough that I'm not afraid anymore? That's really all I'm looking for. No, no, no. That wouldn't be fair. It must be a trade. And just as I keep your fear, you will keep my trade. So what do I get? You cannot know. But it will be, above all, fair. fair. Yeah, I get it. So what do we do? Tell me something that you are afraid of. <sighs> the list's pretty long these days. Okay, you know what? Driving. I can't drive a car anymore. I can ride in them, fine, but as soon as I'm behind the wheel... The sides press in, the air seems to suck out, and the wheel burns under your hands. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Can you take that away? With pleasure. Hold this little bottle in your hand. Think about the way you feel when the fear comes over you. Think about the sensations in your mind. Very good. Now, hand me the bottle. It's full. How did that happen? You filled it. You have bottled your fear for me. Thank you. Here you are. An old necklace? A charm. It signals your new freedom. Wear it. The deal is made. Just like that? You act as if nothing of consequence just happened. I promise you, something has. And maybe you don't believe me, but she was right. The next morning, I got in the car, and I drove. I think I drove 200 miles. I couldn't believe how good just one change in my wreck of a life could feel. Yes! Dr. Cates, of course, had to downplay it. How are you with other enclosed places? Look, one thing at a time. Can't I just enjoy this? Oh, by all means. May I ask, what's that necklace you're wearing? Uh, lucky charm, I guess. Do you believe in those? I believe in the mind. It sounds like a dodge, I know, but it's really the essence of my profession. Mm. So are you mad that this gravy train might not be coming around anymore? I'll carry on somehow. But if you don't worry about that, then I won't worry about your jewelry. Sound like a fair deal? Fair deal. What are you... Why would you say that? No particular reason. Just being friendly. Well, you're not my friend. <laughs> and again with the writing. How are things with Brooke? Brooke? I mean, she's amazing. She's steady, you know? Hasn't wavered at all through this. She's more annoying than you sometimes. You told me you became involved after the accident, is that right? Well, involved, involved, I guess, yeah. But we'd known each other for years, all three of us. Her and Paul and I. You were all friends? Yeah, we were like, uh... 
the Three Musketeers? No. <laughs> no. Uh, we were like a punk band. Us against the world, you know? <clears throat> One, two, three. <clears throat> this is the heaviest damn sofa ever. Yeah, but it was free. <laughs> Nothing comes for free. Aw, oh, two strong men wearing out already. Oh, 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 hang on, I'm slipping. Whoa, wait, look out! Oh! <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I think it looks good right there. All right, guess I'll just have a nap here in the stairwell. Good night. Don't. No, no, I'll be fine. Sleeping in the stairwell in the middle of the city. Go ahead, go on, go on. Rest for it. No! Up the stairs <laughs> you go! Right behind you guys. Punk band. <laughs> I guess moving a sofa isn't really all that punk. But it was the first thing that came to mind. Because we were awesome, the three of us. People thought it was weird that we all spent so much time together, but we didn't care. Maybe Brooke and I getting together was destined to happen under the circumstances. We had to move closer to fill in what we'd lost. It was the first time I'd really looked back on a happy memory. I was grateful for that. I thought... Finally, I'm on my way out of this. Walking from my car to the elevator, I saw something small moving on the ground. A cockroach coming out of a crack in the wall. It was marching around, its little antennae waving and searching. I couldn't help watching it, wondering where it was going, what it was looking for, whether it had any choice, or whether it was just helplessly driven by whatever signal made those antennae move. And then I suddenly saw more of them coming out of the crack. Dozens, hundreds, thousands sweeping out along the ground, up the walls, marching and probing and chattering. This chattering sound I'd never heard a bug make, like a million little wet teeth. They were crawling up my legs, brushing those little antennae against my skin, exploring, tasting, and I couldn't move. I... <laughs> Chris! Chris, can you hear me? Oh, God. I'm calling 911. No, don't, don't, don't. I'm okay. Hey, you're not okay. You're on the floor of the garage. You're drenched no, in sweat. I, I just, I, it was just a bad moment. Wait, wait where are you going? Come I, upstairs. I, I just need some air. I'll be back. I'm coming with you. Don't! Brooke, I need some quiet is all. I don't know why I thought of it as quiet. The city at night had never seemed louder. It was keen and intense. It felt so much more alive than the walking coma I'd been in. That's what I really wanted. Brooke couldn't understand. Welcome, my friend. Don't call me friend. You're not my friend. And your cure didn't work at all. Are you afraid of driving? No, but that's not the point. I just saw a cockroach and practically curled up into a ball. That's never happened before. Oh, the cockroach. It is a delicious horror, isn't it? Like a little machine of filth spawning in the dark. Okay, stop, stop! Why am I suddenly afraid of them? What did you do to me? I did nothing but make a trade. You gave me one of your fears. Perhaps you felt like you weren't afraid enough anymore. That doesn't make any sense! But it does. You have a deep suffering in you. A monumental terror... It is like a factory, a great machine that produces thousands of little daily frights. If you wish to be free of what haunts you, this is the product you have to deal in. That's what I want! How do I get rid of it? Just tell me what it is and trade it to me. I don't know what it is. There was an accident. Uh, that started it. Tell me what happened. I, I was driving my brother and I in a storm. Reminds me of the nights we used to have to spend in the basement, right? Wondering if a tornado was going to touch down, suck us all up, and send us to Oz. I hated those nights. I hated that basement. Hated it? Even after all the board games I let you win? Let me win? Oh, so that's the story you're going with now? Shit! I lost control by a bridge. We went into the water. And what happened then? I don't remember. Yes. Yes, you do. Only little bits. The water coming in. My brother calling out. Chris! Chris! 
And then I woke up on the shore. He saved me somehow, got me out. But he didn't survive. No. They found him in the car. His foot was stuck where the side had caved in. Somehow he got me out, but he couldn't save himself. How terrible. They say to drown is the most horrifying death you can experience. Oh, God. I know we brought him up. I know we buried him. But sometimes I still imagine him down there in the water. I don't want anyone to know. Ah, there it is. You have succeeded. Give it to me. What? Did I just... You have revealed your suffering. This will cure so many fears. It is a most valuable trade. Take this in return. It looks like a big... What, what do they call those? Dream catchers? This is quite the opposite. It is a dream deliverer. I promise you. Now you will sleep. And now you will dream unencumbered by the memory of your suffering. That's amazing. Thank you. Thanks are not necessary. We have dealt evenly and fairly. Absolutely even. Have a good night. I went home. I was excited. For the first time since I could remember, I was looking forward to getting into bed. I hung the dream thing up right away. What are you doing? What is that thing? Just a little talisman. Let this represent that I've made up my mind to sleep better. What did you do out there? Just a couple hours ago, you were in worse shape than I've ever seen you. And now you... I, I just got things in order. Confronted some stuff. Made up my mind to get better. That's the first step, right? To decide you want to be better? Of course, yes. Only one thing. What? Stop leaving me. Stop shutting me out. I will. I promise. I'm sorry, Brooke. So what can I do? Oh, just let me hold you. And let's get a good night's sleep. <laughs> I can do that. Let's do that right away. <laughs> mm. Would you like some warm milk? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't move. Stay right here. Mm. Oh, stay right here. Mm -mm. I did sleep that night, and I dreamed no nightmares this time. I even saw my brother, and Brooke was there too. It was like old times. <laughs> we were out walking somewhere, three astride on the sidewalk. Brooke walked between us, holding both our hands. She did that so often. I decided to tell Dr. Cates about it. That quack loved talking about dreams. Well, it sounds quite lovely on the surface. What do you mean on the surface? I mean, it is what it is, right? Pardon me, you're right. I misspoke. No, no. Come on, tell me. I didn't have the dream, so I can't say. But there are times that idealization can be another form of deflection, avoidance. And the relationship between two brothers is complex enough. You add a woman that you have feelings for. And... Hey, nothing happened until after the accident. But had you experienced any attraction before? Had you thought about her in that way? I don't... What's the point? Let's put it less emotionally. The three of you held hands. Can you remember who took whose hand? Who initiated the gesture? This is bullshit. You're not helping at all. You're, you're just making trouble. Uh, you know, I think I'm worse off with you. Throwing money away, too. This will always be a voluntary process. Yeah, well, I'm volunteering myself out. Why did you stop going? You've been doing so much better. I held your hand. What? We would walk down the street, you, Paul, and me, and we'd hold hands. O only it wasn't you reaching out to both of us. You took his hand, then I took yours. What are you talking you about? You didn't reach out to me. I had to do it to you. I, I, I mean, maybe, sometimes. Who remembers? The point was we were together. I miss him, too. I think you miss him in a different way than I do. Of course. He's your brother. That's not what I mean. Chris, don't. You were always in love with him. He was the one you wanted. Yeah, please, stop it. Say it. Say that you loved him. I love both of you. I always did. And I loved you right from the start. You knew it, too. God, you must have thought I was pathetic chasing the two of you around. And, and what are you doing now, huh? 
Do I just look enough like him to get by, huh? You are out of your mind now, and I don't have to listen to this. Yeah, there you go. Real supportive. Real, oh, real supportive. Guess I'll just handle this myself. Like always. Pretty soon the walls started closing in on me. I couldn't stand to look around. I'd just see pictures of the three of us. And I just knew she was smiling only for him. The truth was out now, and it seemed like I was the one who was least afraid of it. Not like Brooke, who was just going to keep on denying. Denying and lying. Everywhere I went, I could feel people staring, judging me with their eyes, thinking about me as the runt, the third wheel, pitying me. I wanted to scream at them all. They didn't know what I'd been through. Didn't know what I'd had to struggle through all by myself. I was the one who survived, and that counted for nothing. And then I found myself again on this street. The street I could only find when I forgot which way I was going. If it isn't my favorite customer... What are you doing to me? I am not doing anything to you. I just make... Yeah, yeah, fair trade. Screw you. Everything is going to pieces on me and you're doing something. You're tricking me. Tricking you? What an insult. You asked to make a deal for your fears and I took them and gave you an even return. Honest and above board. Do you fear the things you feared before? No, but more stuff is happening. And I am not responsible. You make your own fears, boy, and if you are still afraid, it's because you've been holding out on me. What? I can smell it. Deep inside you, the tantalizing aroma of a monstrous fear. One you have jealously hoarded, hiding it even from your own mind. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes. Yes, you do. I want to make a deal. Right now. Trade me this fear. I want it. I crave it. Take the bottle in your hand. You'll take it away? Yes. Yes. I don't know what I'm looking for. Yes, you do. Just look. Look into the darkness. And if I don't see anything? Then listen instead. Listen. Listen. I hear it. Yes. Chris! Oh, God, it's his voice. I hear his voice. You've never stopped hearing it. Chris, I'm stuck. My foot! What are you doing? Chris, oh, God! Chris, don't go! Help me! Help me! He was... stuck. It was like... fate. Perfect fate. All I had to do was nothing. All you had to do was live. And have what I wanted. I remember now. I swam for the surface. All by myself. I swam so strong. I felt stronger than I'd ever felt. I did it all. Without his help. You are afraid to know this. Are you afraid anymore? No. I won't run from it. I lived. He drowned. It's how I wanted it. And you will never fear it again. The deal is made. This is amazing. I feel... powerful. There are few walking the earth who can say that they don't fear the monster inside them. Congratulations. And now I leave you. Leave? Where are you going? I don't know. A new city, perhaps. But first, I just want to look at a tree. A tree? What are you talking about? Farewell, honest trader. I went to follow, but I froze right at the door. My imagination was suddenly filled with thoughts about the outside, about... Bugs. Bugs. And beasts that lurk. And beasts that lurk. And in the shadows. Even stranger things. The outside was too much now. I couldn't even reach for the door handle. For thinking about all that was out there, waiting to stare and stalk and devour me. 
I just couldn't. I didn't know what Dr. LeBeau was going to trade for my fear. She traded me her own, the fear of outside, the fear that kept her imprisoned inside this shop. I was never afraid of Paul's memory or anyone's judgment ever again, but I would always be afraid of that door. That is why I am here. That is why I am always here, always open, ready to make a trade. So tell me, what are you afraid of? The Sounds Below is a presentation of Earbud Theater, produced by Casey Wolf, Brandon Coluccio, and Aaron Drown. It was written and directed by Nicholas Thurkettle, and stars McLeod Andrews as Chris, Jill Carey Martin as Dr. LeBeau, Christine Weatherup as Brooke, Nicholas Thurkettle as Dr. Cates, and Jackson Tobiska as Paul. All of the music for this episode was by Lyndon Scarf, particularly his album Music for a Lost Film. He made this album available with a Creative Commons license, and for someone as brilliant as he is, it's an incredibly generous contribution to the creative community. We hope you'll seek him out on SoundCloud or freemusicarchive.org and pick up some of his work. And lastly, we'd like to announce that three of our pod plays, Habitat, Be Little, and Escape, The End of Humanity Song, are eligible for Audioverse Awards for 2014. Voting for these awards will be taking place throughout November, so we hope you'll go to audioverseawards.net and cast your own vote. Thank you, as always, for listening. Subscribe to Earbud Theater and give them a rating and review. You can find them on Twitter, on Facebook, and most crucially, in podcast land. So again, that's Earbud Theater. That's theater with an E-R. This show came to us through the submissions, which I promise I do listen to. We just had to wade through some crates and blow the dust off a few old records. But that's what you want from a great DJ. You want them to excel at digging through crates and finding that crisp and perfect 45. You want them to find that track that vibrates and shimmers with heat and makes you want to dance. Or in this case, an audio drama that transmutes your blood to ice. Anyway, thanks for listening to Radio Drama Revival. If you want to help the show, head to our website, radiodramarevival.com, and hit up our PayPal link on the right-hand side. We could also really use your ratings on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcatcher. It helps us grow the show. And now, it's time for some credits. Our theme music is Danger Digi Do by DJ Stranger Danger. You can find his music on SoundCloud. Our line producer is Matthew Boudreaux, who is most assuredly into hoodoo, not voodoo. He's got a conjure eye all white with cataracts, says he can see devils with it. I didn't believe him, but once he reached just behind my head and yelled, Gotcha! and wrung the neck of an invisible thing. He held it out to me, but I saw nothing. When he threw it into the fireplace, I saw the sparks rise up when it landed. I heard the crackling of its fat. Our interview's producer is Eli McElveen, who runs a photography shop in Hamilton, Ontario. Oh, he'll print photos of your dog, and Sean will do digital touch-up for your Christmas cards, but what you really want to see is the antique cameras in back. The photographs they take really capture the spirit of the subject. Why don't you sit for a photo and find out? Heather Cohen and Monique Boudreau are our researchers. For Hanukkah this year, Heather gave me this little statue she carved out of soapstone. It looks like a little human fist, and every day when I wake up, it seems like it's unclenched a little. Heather won't tell me what she's getting me for my birthday. You'll see, she says. Monique wants me to tell you about her new Etsy shop where she sells bottled screams. Oh, and enamel pins. Classic Monique. Our executive producer is Fred Greenhalge, whose youth I did not steal such that I might live twice the span of normal men. That's a weird thing to ask me. Why would you say that? Get out. You bore me. I'm tired of you. Get out, I said. I'm your host, David Reinstrom. And this has been Radio Drama Revival. All storytellers welcome.